I don't even know where to begin because my husband and I watched the film Wish Man last night and it was so beautiful, so moving. So first, Frank, can I ask you, was this a wish, was this a dream come true for you? Well, it is, yes. And it was never, I never wanted to think about me when Greg said, you know, what's your story? I, and I mean, just my wish to have my story told. I didn't know we were talking about a feature motion picture at the time. And that's the fact when they said, we're going to do a movie, I thought you were talking about a documentary. And he said, no, a feature motion picture. I said, no, we're not going to do that. I said, yes, we are. And obviously, he won the argument. <laughs> but it's just so surreal. I mean, the whole journey, six years now, from the inception to when it actually got released. Uh, and one of the things I demanded was script approval, because I've worked with Hollywood before. They like to embellish <laughs> a little bit. So when you see based on a true story, it's not the true story. But they did so good in keeping that somewhat. We, Kitty and I say about 70% of it isn't in fact factual. But that's why it took so long to write that screenplay with Theo Davies, the director and the screenwriter, who did such a fantastic job. It's just fine tuning, fine tuning, fine tuning to where it was acceptable to her, me, and him. And I think, it, I think it resonated with the audiences, too. Oh, absolutely. And I think it, it's, this is a movement. This is going to create such an impact. Um, and I think we need more movies like this. And, of course, we need people to live lives like yourselves. <laughs> so in the movie, Kitty, you two really didn't get along very well. Was that, is that true at the, at the very beginning? No, no, we didn't get along very really? well. <laughs> he was angry. He had a chip on his shoulder. And we just, yeah. It, wasn't a, it was not even a love-hate relationship, let's put it that way. So what was the moment where you kind of thought, you know, there's a lot more than, than I see here? It probably when uh, I got involved with the Make-A-Wish, when he asked me to join the Make-A-Wish staff and be on the board, and I saw a whole different side of him with the kids, totally different person than, than he was out on the street and being a policeman. So when you, when you were there with the, the seven-year-old boy who got to be a police officer, was that, did you really know that that was going to change your life forever? No, no not at the time. Not at the time. Um, like I so said, we granted his wish, and he was the inspiration to start the foundation. But when, we went, when I went back to his funeral in Illinois to give him a full police funeral, and we're being followed by the press. Now, this is before the days of Internet. This is cell phones, anything like that. But the press, like the cameras, were following us all around. You know, what are you doing? How, what about this little boy? And I started seeing all this and thinking maybe we can do something special. I was flying home when I got the idea. This little boy had a wish, and we made it happen. Why can't we do that for other children? And that was maybe 36,000 feet over Kansas or somewhere. But I just had a feeling that we was going to succeed. Now, Greg Reed uses a thing called stickability. Because everybody that I went to that was involved with Chris making it happen for him, I said, this is my idea. They said, it's not going to work. Nobody's heard of this. I don't want to get involved. And that very discouraging. But again, stickability, or what I was taught was a kid by Juan Delgadillo, who they mentioned today. Anytime there's a negative, turn it to a positive. And I've used that my whole police career, especially. And so we're going to make this happen. And obviously, we did. <laughs> Um, did you continue your relationship with Juan, by the way? Oh, up until his passing away about 10 years ago. Oh, very close. For, and I'm still very close with the family, wow. with his sons, the whole family. Yeah. So I feel that, that you know, Juan passed something on to you, which you passed on now to this, uh, this massive organization. And we just spoke with Johnny, who is a, a Make-A-Wish kid. He's a wish kid. And that must feel so... I mean, I, I, I can't even put it into words. How do you feel when a child that, you know, needed the help and you were able to help and you're looking at him, he's in his 30s right now, playing lacrosse. Right. Stop it. <laughs> um, well, that, that's my payback. I speak, now I'm on a new speaking career all over the nation and my meet and greets are, and I'm boasting here, usually an hour and a half to two hours. Because it's not that I'm such a great speaker, but so many people of an average audience to 300 come up on this meet and greet saying, I'm the mother, brother, brother, father, sister, aunt, uncle of a wish child, and I want to talk about that. Or the biggest thing, I'm a wish child that comes up and I get to meet. Now me, that's my biggest payback ever, to meet these children. And I always ask them, what was your children? They're now adults. <laughs> what was, but they'll always be a wish kid. I remind them of that. I could be 80 years old to be a wish kid. But what was your wish? And I'll just watch their eyes. 
and I can see them relive that whole thing. But the most interesting one recently was on the set of the movie. I'm the consultant producer, technical advisor. I work very close every morning with the script supervisor. We're the first ones on the set. We go over the screenplay for the day, the set design, continuity, everything. The third day in, she knows who I was. She knows what the movie's about. She comes in, gives me a hug, and starts crying. I'm a big tears. Kennedy, what's wrong? I'm a wish child. Now that, the whole crew is crying. I'm crying. Everybody's crying. Just the greatest story on her. We've remained friends now. We, we, I follow her all over the world. Um, so in the movie, there's a scene where you, you left a hat behind. And so you're wearing a hat today. Is that the same hat? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this is my go to church hat. Okay, that's <laughs> yeah. a good hat. No, that's yeah. a little Hollywood magic um, that we recreated for a scene. But I've always worn since a kid. I was raised in a cowboy and ranches, around ranches and that. So it's just part of the culture, always wearing a cowboy hat. But they wanted that one special scene in there, so we came up with that. And, and you see how it resonates through the movie. It's not just dropping it there, but how the final scene in the movie with the hat. It's so beautiful. It was so beautifully done. It was amazing. So today you are receiving your Las Vegas star. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I can say I'll probably have another two hours worth of questions for you, but I'll try to keep it short, shorter. Um, so here you are getting cemented <laughs> in Las Vegas. I never thought about that. People walking all over me every day. I never thought about but that. But you're, you know, it's great because you're alive to see it. So that's even better, right? Then, yeah. you know, yeah. so. Then the alternative. Yes, yeah, exactly. So, you know, and so my husband and I live here in Las Vegas. So we'll be sure to come by and visit you, you know, every day. Turn it up a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I'll keep, I'll keep, I'll keep it nice. Maybe send, you know, make sure it looks really good. Um, how does that feel? It, it's, I can't really find the words to describe that. I mean, it. It's humbling, it's embarrassing in a sense, but it's so, it's so just surreal and, and such an honor, such an honor to have that on there. Now it's kind of fun, uh, I did get to visit my dad as a teenager, he lived in Chicago, and one of his famous, uh, favorite artists at the time was Bobby Darin. Oh, yeah. And now I've also got to meet Elvis Presley's stepbrother, David Stanley, who's a very good friend. Well, my star is only a couple up from Bobby Darren and Elvis Presley. So when we first saw that installed and walk in there, the first thing I thought was my dad, then I thought of my buddy David Stanley with Elvis Presley right there. So it's just, we're all together and out of course, Greg Reed. <laughs> yeah, it's so touching that your dad was looking for you all those years and your mom, um, bless her heart, and I know that she's passed. Mm -hmm. And you had made um, amends with her, yeah. right? So that's that's really good. And um, if there was one message that you wanted to share with anybody out there, whether they are dealing with their own tragedy, if they're dealing with illness, if they're dealing, um, which is hardship, what words of encouragement do you have for them, Frank? And I'm going to ask you the same thing. Well, and the biggest thing I was taught was a child, and, and they, they broke from this Juan Delgadillo. You know, everybody has hiccups in their life, but just grin and bear it. Just What's the worst thing that can happen from there? Just grow from it. Grow from those experiences. But again, what he taught me, turns those negatives into a positive. Find a way to do that. You don't have enough food to eat today, but you got a little bit of food. But learn how you got to work hard to get that more food that you want. And then the other thing he taught me, give back, help somebody out. Everyone can be a hero. Miss Kitty. I, I can't stop crying around you, too. I don't know. <laughs> If I are you talking about somebody that's on the down, very down, and very on down the end? And, you know, it's hard to get up. And, yeah, and I point. think I'll probably all of us in our life have been there for a minute. I would say to them, if you feel like you can't go on, get up and go do something for somebody else. It'll change your life, and it'll make you stop thinking about what it is that's making you sad or depressed. Just get up and go do go do something, anything. Go take a homeless man a, a sandwich in the middle of your grief or whatever it is. Do something for somebody else. Yeah. Well, thank you both. You, you're, you're such beautiful souls. Well, thank you. And, and a perfect example, uh, help somebody out, give back. And what I was taught also, you don't have that money to give back. Now, we live on a retirement income, but we give back. She's on the board of an animal group. She spends numerous hours. She's giving giving back by her time. 
I sit on several nonprofit boards right now, advisor and also uh, on board members, giving back by that way. Just my past experience for 38 years, so I am giving back. We don't have to have money to do it. We don't have to have money. Yeah, five minutes of your time will change somebody's life. I love it. Okay, here's my final question. It's a fun one. The final line in the movie that's written up on screen. Do you remember this? Do we still annoy each other? Yes, <laughs> yes we do. Oh, darling. <laughs> Yes, we do. So Kitty tells me that they had a five-hour drive up here to Las Vegas, and she said some of those moments rang true. <laughs> but you know, you're strong, and um, you know, you've been married. Yeah, you believe in the same thing, and that's that's probably what makes marriage work and beautifully. So you two have come together for a reason, and thank you so much for all that you do. Congratulations. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.